Alexa, what's the temperature? Right now, it's 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Today, expect a high of 64 degrees. Hey, Steve, your phone is on. Yeah, my phone's on? Yes, sir. We can hear and see. Well, my pants aren't. <laughs> you can't see that, though. Thank you, Chewy. You're welcome. I was talking to Alexa. It wasn't my phone. That's my companion in the morning. It tells me what temperature it is. Correct. They haven't gaveled in yet. Steve, your video's on. Yep. I think I got to have my video on to be counted as here. All right. Okay, you put your pants on. There you go. Okay. Uh, committee and transportation infrastructure will come to order. Uh, ask unanimous consent authorizing chair to declare recess during the hearing. Uh, and. Um, We'll now go to my opening statement, which is somewhere. I read it before. There it is. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you know, before we start, uh, I'd like to ask uh, for a moment of silence uh, for uh, um, our colleague, Don Young, uh, uh, you know, with who I served with for 35 years and some odd months. He was here longer than that. Uh, he was... Don was larger than life. I've got Don Young stories like everybody else does with the knife and the, all the other things, but we, we became good friends uh, over those years. Um, we served together on uh, the House Committee on Natural Resources and then obviously on the Committee of Transportation Infrastructure. Um, you know, he did the last significant bill originating from this committee on service transportation infrastructure, in my, my opinion, and we We've done one since, but uh, the safety Lou bill, uh, which was a, a great benefit uh, to the nation. Um, he stayed uh, true to his values, the people of Alaska, and um, you know his service was extraordinary. So I, I just will just observe a, a moment of silence. Now I'd like to uh, to thank uh, the uh, the chair, National Transportation Safety Board, uh, Chair uh, Jennifer Hamadi, for being uh, appearing before us today. She, what? Oh, I'm so scared. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, I will. I move to another page. Okay, Sam. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. It uh, um, it is truly a sad day for the committee when the when the dean of the house. Uh, and our former chairman uh, passed away. So I began my congressional career the same year that Don took over um, the committee in 2001. From day one, he was always a friend and, um, and a mentor to me, and, and, uh, and I know uh, he was to so many of us, uh, obviously, on the, on the committee. And we all know how fiercely he fought for Alaska and how fiercely he fought for, um, uh, for the people of Alaska. Um, and we also know just how passionate he was about this committee and the work that we do here. And he never failed to set a tone of, of bipartisanship to make sure that the work um, that the work always got done. And you know, <clears throat> I think that that when he had his committee portrait um, done, he knew that one day he would be gone, um, but he would uh, never want any of us to forget his um, uh, his example. So he made sure that we were always able to look right up there. And, uh, and remember that this committee is about working together for the good of America's um, infrastructure and our obviously many modes of transportation. But um, with that, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity and, and uh, it is the end of an era. Um, I, thanks, uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, Don does have a unique portrait uh, and uh, you know, we'll miss him. 
Uh, so now, I would like to uh, formally thank uh, National Administration Safety Board uh, Chair uh, Jennifer Momendi uh, for appearing for us today. She has sat on this side uh, for many, many years and, and uh, worked on this committee. Uh, she was a tireless uh, advocate for safety while serving as staff director, uh, subcommittee on railroads, pipelines, hazardous materials from 2004 to 2018. Um, you know, we went, we went through a, a lot of struggles in that time. I particularly remember the, uh, the issue over uh, the uh, tank cars, <laughs> which we've mostly solved, but we still got some. Yeah. Um, you know, the NTSB is an independent federal agency responsible for civil uh, transportation accident investigations. It's charged with investigating every uh, civil aviation accident in the United States and um, um, when uh, with through international agreements overseas uh, and significant uh, accidents that occur in other modes of transportation such as major uh, accidents that involve railroad, highway, maritime, or pipeline. Uh, the agency establishes the facts, the circumstances, determines the probable cause, issues safety recommendations aimed at preventing future accidents, many of which are still pending. Uh, the NTSB was last reauthorized in the FAA Reauthorization Act 2018, and its current authorization expires at the end of this fiscal year. Uh, that's why it is uh, important uh, for us to hear from NTSB today about its reauthorization proposal, its challenges, priorities for meeting safety missions in the coming years, and even as the transportation safety as ex uh, sector has expanded the size of the uh, USDOT has increased by more than 2,000 employees, and TSB has remained to the same staffing levels. And with the caseload at NTSB increasing, many long-serving NTSB employees near retirement, the agency needs uh, to attract new talent for the future. Uh, moreover, as it expands its hiring pool, it must seek to attract a diverse uh, workforce, prioritize equity, inclusion, accessibility, Another important item addressed in NTSB's authorization is the timeliness of its accident investigation reports from 16 to 20. Uh, the average length uh, it took to investigate uh, cross modes uh, crept from 18.7 months to 21.6 in 2020. Um, and the longer it takes NTSB to analyze and then issue reports and recommendations, uh, the longer it takes for other agencies or Congress uh, to implement them. And these delays, uh, you know, have potential detrimental uh, impacts on safety. So I look uh, forward to hearing uh, for, from Chair Hamadi on what resources uh, the agency needs, hopefully unconstrained by concerns at OMB or the White House or anywhere else, uh, straight up what you need. Um, and I also uh, want to acknowledge um, the recent crash on March 21st, 2022 of the Boeing 737-800NG operated by China Eastern Airlines in southern China, killing all 132 passengers and crew aboard. Uh, obviously, our, our thoughts and prayers go out uh, to the, uh, the victims, their families, and friends. Uh, while we're uh, awaiting details uh, with the um, cooperation uh, with the uh, uh, hopefully of the Chinese government. Uh, I want to hear about uh, the role that NTSB and other U.S.-based stakeholders may play in the ongoing investigation. Um, it's a puzzling uh, accident, and uh, we need to, um, you know, find out what uh, went on with that flight. Uh, an ongoing uh, uh, concern for this committee is the FAA's implementation of the Aircraft Certification Safety Accountability Act, a AC. SAA, acronyms abound, um, recommendations and recommendations from the NTSB and other investigative authorities following uh, the 737 MAX crashes. While the NTSB was not the lead civil aviation authority, NTSB did participate, took decisive action by issuing a series of recommendations um, and to the FAA in September 2019 related to assumptions used in the safety assessment process, the effects of multiple alerts, and indications on pilot performance. Uh, we base several provisions uh, on the aircraft certification uh, reform legislation on those recommendations. Now, uh, Boeing is seeking certification from the FAA of the 737 MAX 10, uh, which unlike every other uh, you know, uh, 
passenger aircraft being produced in the world today and over quite a number of years uh, will not have an advanced flight crew alerting system. Uh, became the industry standard in 82, even before I was on this committee, uh, on every uh, other uh, Airbus and Boeing model except for the 737s. Uh, the uh, aircraft certification bill gave the FAA a two-year grace period to certify aircraft without advanced flight crew alerting system, but that grace period uh, should not be extended. And I urge the FAA, who might be listening, to take a close look at the NTSB's recommendations and this committee's extensive investigations a report before completing its certification. I look forward uh, to hearing from uh, Chair Harmondy on these issues and, and others. And, and now I'd recognize um, Ranking Member Sam Graves for his opening statement. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witness, um, Chairman uh, Harmondy, for being here. The, uh, the NTSB plays an important role in assuring safety uh, across you know, all modes of transportation. And the committee is aware of the NTSB's reauthorization proposal and appreciates today's opportunity to discuss it, uh, uh, discuss it with you. The board was last reauthorized with the FAA um, reauthorization in 2018, where we made a lot of important improvements to the agency's organization, how the agency conducts investigations and the kind of information provided to Congress in the agency's annual report and most wanted list. As the committee considers the agency's reauthorization proposal this year, we should also be looking at how NTSB has implemented the various requirements of its current authorization law. And I also encourage members to be thinking about additional issues to ensure that the NTSB carries out its duties in a more efficient and effective manner. Uh, as Chair Hominy knows, the NTSB's backlog of accident reports and investigations is unacceptable. While I'm pleased that the agency has taken action to address the backlog, we need to ensure that this kind of issue does not occur again. A more efficient NTSB will yield timelier reports and recommendations and better equip the transportation sector with the information that it needs to maintain and improve uh, safety. Um, so I look forward to hearing um, what you have to say on your priorities and, and uh, I look forward to reviewing the NTSB's submitted proposal more closely. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Chair Hamadi, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, and good morning, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, and members and staff of the committee. As chair of the NTSB, I thank you for the opportunity to be, appear before you today in support of our reauthorization request. I'd also like to thank you for being one of the NTSB's biggest safety champions. Your leadership on transportation safety is unparalleled, and your support of NTSB recommendations has brought about significant safety improvements in the United States and across the globe. Unfortunately, many of you know our agency because of our investigations of tragedies that occurred in your districts or affected your constituents personally, like the duck boat sinking in Branson, Missouri, and the Amtrak derailment in DuPont, Washington. I'd like to take a moment to remember those who died or were injured in these and other tragedies that we've investigated and offer our deepest sympathies to the survivors and families we've come to know. Part of the mission of the NTSB is to support the victims' families. We give them the only promise we can that we will investigate and issue safety recommendations aimed at preventing similar tragedies and work vigorously to see that those rec safety recommendations are implemented. That's not just our agency's mission, it's also the mission of our workforce. We are a small but mighty agency of 404 highly skilled professionals and every single one has dedicated their lives to transportation safety. The people of NTSB are on call around the clock every day of the year, ready to launch to the scene of an accident or crash anywhere in the world. Their dedication to safety ensures that lessons are learned from every tragedy we investigate. Our workforce inspires me every day by putting our mission first. Between the time I was nominated and sworn in as chair, I met with staff throughout our agency to listen and learn about their needs, our successes, and our greatest challenges. This reauthorization proposal was driven by our workforce. It addresses their vision for our agency, and we're here today to advocate for them. 
Our reauthorization proposal represents an investment in a skilled workforce because it's our people who will ensure the NTSB is a mission-first agency for years to come. The bill will support our mission in four ways. First, it will allow us to begin right-sizing the agency workforce, which has been stagnant for two decades. We are roughly, we're at roughly the same number of FTEs as we were in 1998, even as the demands on our staff rise with increasingly complex investigations. Our proposal will allow us to fill empty positions and modestly expand in staffing across all modes and offices to meet future transportation safety challenges. Quite simply, we need more people. But it's not just about headcount. The skills we need for our future workforce are also important. That leads me to the second thing our bill will accomplish, which is to provide our workforce with the training and development needed to keep pace with the rapid change and technological advancement taking place in transportation. For example, we're seeing new vehicles on our roads, railways, waterways, and in our skies. This includes advanced air mobility, unmanned aircraft systems, and autonomous vessels and vehicles. We're also seeing new fuel sources like hydrogen and lithium ion batteries. And we're seeing new ways of transporting people and goods like commercial human space flight. While exciting, each of these advancements presents unique safety risks, and the NTSB must be, will be, ready to respond to all of them. Third, our bill will allow us to procure the equipment and technology our people need to conduct cutting edge investigations in this changing landscape. Finally, the bill also includes measures to enhance the agency's accountability and improve our processes and products. In closing, our reauthorization proposal represents an investment in a skilled workforce because it's our people who will ensure we're ready should your constituents or anyone else need us in the wake of a transportation tragedy. If we do these four things with the funds we have requested, we'll be better positioned to serve our vital safety mission today and tomorrow. We'll be truly mission first. I appreciate your support of the NTSB. Thank you for your consideration and thank you so much for your transportation safety leadership. Amazing, perfectly five minutes, uh, but I do ask unanimous consent that the uh, full uh, testimony of the chair be uh, included in the record uh, without objection. Uh, so ordered, um, we were having a, a little chat before uh, the hearing, uh, myself and the chair and uh, Representative Larson, so I, I'm gonna defer to Representative Larson for the first uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I appreciate that. Um, as uh, the um, uh, NTSB uh, continues its support of the investigation in China, the China Eastern Flight is an issue, obviously of great importance, because the airplane is built in Washington State by the great women and men who work on the lines there at, in Renton. And so I was hoping you could give us an update on, to the extent that you can, on the investigation, but also, um, maybe talk a little bit about the uh, this point you made about the increasingly complex systems that you're dealing with, but uh, an increasingly global conversation we have in aviation, and if, if there's anything in the budget that you think we need to think about uh, in terms of getting your people overseas when they need to be overseas. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. On China, we are the state of design and manufacture. So the NTSB appointed a U.S. accredited representative under Annex 13, and uh, she and two technical advisors from the NTSB, as well as three, uh, four technical advisors from Boeing, is in China. Are in China right now. Uh, we have a great working relationship with the Civil Aviation Administration of China, or CAAC. They, we have a long-standing relationship with them. We have worked with them on other investigations. We've even had uh, uh, cross-training with them where we've, our investigators in the past in 2004 has gone to China and they've come here. And so they've been very helpful in getting our team overseas, uh, getting through, getting visas, and then making sure that we get uh, a quarantine waiver. And so that's going very well on the ground. 
And in the meantime, we are working on the repair and download of the CVR and FDR. Um, do you anticipate a timeline, uh, how long your folks will be, uh, need to be in China? Uh, we don't have a set timeline uh, yet, uh, but happy to circle back. You did ask me about budget needs and what we may need going forward. Yeah. One thing that we did put in place here, which I think is tremendous, uh, when I took over as chair, I encouraged our leadership to find areas uh, that we need to address risk for the agency. And Dana Schultz, who's behind me as our managing director, worked with our special operations senior advisor to get an agreement in place with the Department of State to make sure that if something happened, some sort of crisis, even a medical crisis occurred, that our folks could be evacuated in case of emergency. That's something that the agency personnel has wanted in place to, since 2013, and now, thanks to the efforts of the Department of State, we have that in place uh, through for, for this investigation, and we'd like to move that forward annually. It will require us to put uh, funding aside uh, to hold in, in an account, so that's something that we'll need some assistance with. Yeah, and I understand it's, it's early in the investigation, and, uh, and you couldn't answer questions about is speculate, we don't want to speculate that anyways, and so I appreciate that um, very much. If you could uh, move towards um, the other um, complexities in the airspace with the advent of uh, AAM, FA, maybe certifying first EV tall, you know, let's say within a year, within two years, and as advanced air mobility gets introduced, how is the NTSB preparing itself for a world of, uh, of the Jetsons, if you will? Yeah, well, the NTSB has really been ahead of others when it comes to preparing for new technologies. In fact, we've called for new technologies before they ever existed. Going back to 1970 when we called for uh, uh, shutting down pipelines and putting in valves before those valves ever existed. And so we have training for our personnel, of course, and we have a substantial experience. We will have to uh, uh, change uh, some uh, uh, of our regulations right, right now, we have an unmanned uh, aircraft system rulemaking in place where we'll change the definition of what, or what needs to be reported to the NTSB for accident and incident response. Um, but as far as your question related to the complexity of investigations, it's not just the investigation of itself, but it's also uh, the review by a research and engineering team of new technologies. We have iPads, we have phones, we have new technologies in aircraft and new technologies in vehicles and vessels that we're, we need to make sure that we're able to evaluate. And part of that is working with new manufacturers, manufacturers and entities who aren't used to working with the NTSB and they don't understand our process. So that takes some education. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, Representative Garrett Graves is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for, for having a moment of silence for our, uh, our colleague, Mr. Young, who, who contributed so much to this committee, and, and just want to thank both you and, and Sam for, for y'all's kind words and, and, and recognition of, of his service to this body and to the state of Alaska. Um, uh, Chair Hammondy, welcome back to the committee. Uh, good to see you again. Um, uh, last year, uh, or excuse me, the last reauthorization bill for NTSB uh, gave you all the authority to operate UAS, uh, unmanned aircraft systems, um, and I understand you're using those to help with, with uh, accident investigations. Um, are, are you using any drones that were manufactured in, in China at this point? We have uh, seven drones right now, and they are all manufactured in China, and we've had them for some time. However, we are now in the process of replacing many that is ending their life cycle, and so we are in the process of purchasing five that would be since our reauthorization, and none of those will be made in China. Great, um, thank you, I, I appreciate that and would appreciate you you keeping us apprised of, of that progress as you uh, work to replace those. Um, uh, the other thing I want to ask you about is uh, commercial space accident investigations. Um, as, as you know, we introduced legislation with uh, Chairman DeFazio and, and Chair Larson and, and Ranking Member Sam Graves um, 
in, in regard to NTSB's Commercial Space Transportation Investigation Authority. And I'm well aware of the notice of proposed rulemaking that NTSB has issued in, in, in this space. Um, uh, clearly, you have bipartisan support uh, from this committee for, for uh, NTSB to, to investigate commercial space transportation uh, accidents. Um, and in regard to the notice of proposed rulemaking, the NPRM that was issued, a number of comments have been provided, and, and I think that there's been some constructive feedback, many of them I, I agree with, and, and um, we're gonna take some of that into consideration because it implicates the approach that we've taken as well in, uh, in the legislation. Uh, I just wanted to um, ask as you work through the, the comments and think about how to uh, tweak the NPRM as it moves to a finalized rule, um, if you would please keep us apprised as well because we are, as I mentioned, gonna continue to work on our legislative approach and, and, and just wanna give you an opportunity to perhaps respond to the NPRM, respond to any comments, and then also um, anticipate you affirming that you'd be willing to work with us uh, as y'all uh, adjudicate the public comments. Yes, absolutely, and we will work with you and the committee, and I know that Mr. Babin also has some concerns and be happy to work with you as well, of course, going forward. He gave me his proxy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you so much for your leadership on this issue and for your assistance. We really appreciate it. And, you know, we are aware of the, uh, obviously, going through the comments right now that have been filed with the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, uh, we are uh, in the process now of reaching out to the industry. I recently visited within the past few weeks uh, SpaceX out in California. We're, I'm going to travel to the other operators to talk to them. I asked the Con uh, Commercial Space Federation to come in and meet with me and our technical team. We had a good discussion. I think it's important that the NTSB sits down with the operators and talks through some of their concerns listens to their concerns and see where we might be able to address some of those concerns. I, and so there's gonna be tremendous outreach and meeting with them at their operations, at their facilities, so that we can, I can also appreciate what they're doing as well. Uh, but we do have significant experience in this area and are moving forward. Uh, at the same time, uh, I anticipate this won't go to a final rule. We'll have a supplemental proposed rulemaking at some point, but we aren't rushing to do that. At the same time, we are going to have conversations with the Federal Aviation Administration uh, about our memorandum of understanding to see if we can update that. That dates back decades and has not been updated, so I reached out to the FAA, had a fantastic conversations with them. I reached out to the Deputy Secretary. We also spoke about that. We'll be sitting down on April 21st to begin those initial conversations, and I think that will be helpful. Thank you. Just remaining seconds left, I just want to reiterate what the Ranking Member Sam Graves mentioned in the backlog. Uh, Madam Chair, as you know, it is absolutely critical that the ultimate investigation reports be released as quickly as possible so we can make whatever appropriate changes or mitigation may be needed to improve safety across all modes of transportation. So I want to thank you for your, your progress, but also please keep this on the front burner. It's a critical issue. Absolutely. Back. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Following up on that last uh, question, um, is it that accidents have become you know, particularly more complicated or, you know, I mean, what is the principal reason why it is taking longer uh, to, uh, you know, put forward these reports and, um, you know, address whatever needs you might have uh, to produce them more timely, quickly? No, great question. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a combination of complexity of the investigations, resource needs, and process that we have to get in place. I will tell you that our managing director, she'll say her religion is data. She came from the Office of Aviation Safety, she ran the Office of Aviation Safety, and she's very focused on collecting data on where this gets hung up. We learned through that it's not in the investigation phase, it's in really the report writing and review phase. And so we needed to change some processes, ensure that we're scaling investigations appropriately. Not everything is a major investigation. And then at the same time, dedicate, dedicate appropriate resources to it. 
Since I've been on board, we brought on some retired annuitants, people who used to work for the NTSB, strictly to go through the backlog. In addition, I will say we looked at our staffing levels. Our Office of Aviation Safety back in, I believe, 2013 was at 137 people. When I took over, it was down to 108. Vacancies had not been filled for years. They were suffering from underinvestment, disinvestment, and so we need to change that. We needed to change that across the agency and get folks hired because they can't do more with less. And that's what they were being asked to do. So now we're moving that forward. The first meeting I had was with OPM to figure out how do we get people in the door? What do we need to change? And now that's all moving forward. Thanks to the folks behind me, they're doing a great deal of work to get things moving again, and it's very exciting. So with all those improvements, I, I think we'll, we'll be able to get through a, a great deal. I will say that at the beginning of February, our Director of Off the Office of Aviation Safety had uh, reported that we had 417 mainly field and limited investigations in aviation that were above two years. Today, we're down to 213. So we're making significant progress, and that was part of what I testified about when I, I uh, at my confirmation hearing, it's critical. So um, those positions were authorized on a continuing basis, but they just weren't filled? Through. They weren't filling them. And that's not just in the Office of Aviation Safety. It's across the board. I mean, it is in every single office that we would hover around high 300s, 400, and we weren't getting, getting through the process of hiring people. I'm not sure why, but now we have procedures in place. We are hiring a chief human capital officer. I have to give great credit to OPM who walked us through how we could uh, uh, change some things in our processes and procedures to get people on board. And it was really asking our, our staff across the board when we, did, when we put together our authorization request, how many people do you need? What do you need for technology? They came back with a request of 192 additional people they would need for us to flourish. This reauthorization proposal doesn't represent that. We would need $250 million to account, accomplish that. Mm -hmm. well, but good. I'll take the 250 if you would like to be so generous. Well, we'll uh, we will, the committee will mull that over. Uh, quickly, since my time's about to expire, the, uh, uh, your so-called Carroll system, uh, case analysis reporting online, uh, my understanding is that uh, you know people who are particularly interested in or want to follow these investigations that it's not very user friendly. Um, what are you doing to address that? Great question, because we agree it isn't user friendly, and uh, it was unveiled I think too early. And what we needed to do was meet with the stakeholder community and see how it was being used and see how we can improve it. And we're doing that now. And it's a top priority of our chief information officer. They're moving forward with changes to make it sure that it is more user friendly. Uh, we did talk about how to videos, except in the last uh, meeting we had, I mentioned you shouldn't need a how to video to find our investigations. So hopefully, uh, we are well on our way to moving forward with improvements so everyone can find the information that they need. Uh, thank you. Uh, and now I would recognize. Uh, Representative Crawford. It's on the Republican side. Uh, hey, whoops. Mr. Chair, thank oh. you. Are you there? Yeah, you got me? Yep. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Madam Chair, uh, can you give me uh, Yeah, an we idea can't how many see you for some reason. Is your are your camera is your camera on? It is. Yep. Yeah, okay. You got me now. Yep. Yep. Go for okay. it. Okay, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, can you give me an idea how many um, rail-related grade crossing accidents you investigate in the course of a year on average? Thank you very much. We review very few rail grade crossing accidents. 
Uh, we certainly review the major ones, but FRA reviews a majority of the uh, great crossing accidents. Um, is, is, is my understanding, is this correct that you're considering reducing that number? Is, is that true? Uh, right now, our, we, under our highway mandate, there is some flexibility for our highway investigators, which do the grade crossing accidents, to choose uh, which grade crossing accidents to focus on. Uh, but in our rail mandate, it says we have to do every rail grade crossing accident and every trespasser accident, which we're simply not able to do. Right now, our uh, rail office has 11 investigators to do all fatalities, all serious injuries, all passenger rail accidents, plus grade crossings, plus trespasser accidents, and we're not able to accomplish that. What we do focus on are the ones that have the biggest safety impact, and we have conducted the larger major grade crossing accidents and the uh, major trespasser accidents. So we do look at each one and decide which one would have the biggest safety benefit. So basically, you, as, as has been addressed earlier, you've got a manpower problem, and is that the biggest, is that the biggest impediment, or is there a calculation that uh, is given with regard to the value of the investigation? Does it, uh, it does it does it add the safety by conducting additional uh, investigation, or is it mostly attributed to uh, lack of manpower? Uh, well, we do have to make sure that we have uh, the manpower, but we do ask ourselves four questions in whether we're determining whether to investigate. First, is there national national interest? Second, is there emerging? issue or one that's repeated that we see that we would want to investigate this accident. Can we make a difference is a third question. And fourth, do we have the resources? Um, can you just kind of walk me through what the protocol is for investigating with regard to uh, FRA and Amtrak and, and working with those um, organizations? Sure. Uh, the Federal Railroad Administration is, uh, is always a party to our investigations, uh, which means they are part of our fact-finding in the investigations, as well as Amtrak when there is an Amtrak investigation. So there's close coordination in the fact-finding portion of the investigation so that if there is a safety deficiency, they can address that immediately. Does, uh, does NTSB investigate uh, freight rail accidents differently than Amtrak? Uh, our, uh, our legislation requires when there is a fatality or serious injury, and then we have to do all passenger rail accidents. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll yield the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Uh, uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, Chair of the uh, Service Transportation Subcommittee. Recognized for five minutes, owner. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Chair Homedy, um, I have a special interest in this hearing because in October, the 7,000 uh, series Metro car on the blue line derailed. Um, I know that the NTSB has uh, done inspections of the entire fleet and found that at least 20 cars were defective. Uh, WMATA has su suspended use of all the 7,000 series cars. Uh, but that, of course, has resulted in scaled back uh, service. I'd be very interested in anything you could tell me about the status of the NTSB's investigation of this critical issue. Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. And we did speak uh, right after that accident uh, or uh, the derailments occurred. And I really appreciate your leadership on this issue and, of course, on all safety issues. Right now, uh, WMATA has contracted with the Transportation Technology Center in Pueblo, Colorado, uh, to do failure analysis of the wheel assembly. 
and in and I am aware of uh, uh, the actions with respect to Wamadan pulling cars out of service. That is something they're working on with the Safety Commission, not with the NTSB. We are aware of 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 movement of that, but we're really focused on the investigation right now on the failure analysis of the wheel assembly and actions that were were or were not taken by Wamada uh, during. Uh, increasing failures of these wheel assemblies. So we'll continue to uh, uh, communicate with you and coordinate you with you as the investigation goes forward. Would very much appreciate that. Uh, in February, I co-led a letter with uh, two Secretary Buttigieg uh, urging the NTS, the, the Department of Transportation, excuse me, uh, to require all highway traffic safety seats to utilize uh, up-to-date male and female crash test dummy technology. You are aware that currently the vehicle safety uh, tests only utilize male crash dummies in the driver's seats and passenger seats. And that's despite the fact that women's and men's bodies are affected differently. And there are real consequences here. We see that women are 17% um, more likely to die and 73% more likely to be seriously injured in a vehicle crash than men. Uh, what would be your uh, opinion of recommending that NHTSA require all safety tests to utilize the most up-to-date female crash test technology, dummy technology? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Uh, this is especially important as we see increases in fatalities and injuries on our roads right now with nearly 40,000 people dying annually. It, this is The NTSB doesn't have a recommendation in this area, but you asked for my opinion, and my opinion is that we should address that. We should have uh, uh, crash test uh, in crash testing, NHTSA should use uh, uh, not just male but female um, um, uh, dummies when they're doing crash testing. Well, why wouldn't the NTSB have a recommendation in this area? I'm, I'm sorry. Why wouldn't the NTSB have a not have a recommendation in this area? This, uh, it, uh, our recommendations are normally geared toward preventing an accident or incident from occurring, and it's not something that has come up in a specific accident or incident, but it is something that is on our radar and something that we're looking at. I, I certainly hope you would look at it and make your views known. In your testimony, you noted that to satisfy current staffing needs, uh, the NTSB will hire nearly 200, will need to hire nearly 200 employees over the next five years. In that time, the number of retirement eligible employees at the agency will grow to roughly 41%. Could you elaborate on the NTSB's strategy to recruit and train a diverse workforce to fulfill this, these growing needs? Yes, and thank and you for that. The time has expired, but briefly answer, please. Yeah, thank you for that question. We do have a, a strategic human capital plan that we're beginning, a workforce development plan, a gap analysis, and we, are, we do have a strategic plan uh, to recruit, retain, and hire a diverse and inclusive workforce that we're now implementing. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank Representative you. Babb. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, and... Chair, uh, Chairwoman Homendy, uh, thank you for being here. In addition to having the pleasure of serving on this esteemed committee, I also serve as a ranking member of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee and represent the Johnson Space Center, home to NASA's human exploration efforts. Uh, this gives me a unique vantage point to assess critical issues across the entire aerospace horizon. One issue that has garnered a bit of attention is NTSB's recent notice of proposed rulemaking for commercial space accident investigations. Uh, Chairwoman Homendy, as you might recall, I wrote you a letter uh, along with our ranking member, Lucas, 
uh, uh, to NTSB last November asking for additional information and documents related uh, to this uh, NPRM. And while we received a, a good response uh, in December, which I thank you for, we unfortunately were not provided with any of the requested records. Uh, as an ardent advocate for safety in all domains, the current NPRM raises some concerns and questions that I think should be addressed. First and foremost, existing statutory responsibilities. I worry that the NTSB is already spread thin and that expanded authority could undercut the good work that you perform daily. And we've seen with just the last uh, several questioners uh, today that there is a manpower issue. Uh, and uh, then I'm also concerned about whether the expertise is really there at NTSB to appropriately carry out this very highly specialized uh, area. Uh, so with that, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent uh, to add my original letter to the, uh, to the uh, uh, NTSB. Thank you so Without much. Without objection. Yes, sir. In addition to responding to the initial letter and document request, I'd also like to ask you a few more questions, if I may. If you could keep your answers uh, very, very short, I would appreciate it. Uh, if you can't answer them now, it's not a problem, but I'd appreciate your response for the record. Number one, how many staff have the NTSB assigned to exclusively specialize in space accidents? Number two, could you please explain the NTSB's request to investigate not just accidents, but also incidents and anomalies that happen routinely almost every single launch that we have? Was, number three, was the NTSB able to coordinate with the NPRM and with the Department of Defense and also the IC, the intelligence community? And four, and finally, what is the status of negotiating the existing MOU with the FAA on commercial accidents? Uh, if you could get those to me or if you could answer some of them right now, we have a couple of minutes left. I would appreciate that. Sure, with the status of the MOU, as I mentioned, our first meeting with FAA and with the Office of the Secretary will be on April 21st. We have been trying to get the FAA to sit down and talk about our updating our MOU since 2014. I'm pleased that we're now gonna have that opportunity to sit down and discuss it and uh, look forward to working together uh, on safety as we do in other modes of trans or uh, in aviation as well. Uh, with respect to um, assets and our ability to conduct investigations, our investigators are not, they aren't um, uh, walled off by this person's space, this person's UAS, this person is aviation, they have particular expertise. We'll have aerospace engineers, we have human performance experts, uh, we have survival uh, flight, uh, survival factors experts, operations experts, and so in total, once we get full staffing in our Office of Aviation Safety, we'll have 132 people in our Office of Aviation Safety. Well, what, about, what about the number for space, essentially specializing in space accidents? As I met, as I met, we do have a leader who is our chief technical officer for space and aerospace technology, and he has incredible expertise. Right now, he runs our Office of Major Investigations and has been involved in commercial space and what the NTSB has done on commercial space for decades. We have conducted a number of investigations involving commercial space since 1993. But with respect to our resources, they are not walled off by industry. They are in particular areas of expertise. So they'll do commercial space and they'll do aviation. They just do them differently. Well, we certainly would appreciate if you could get those documents to us and those records that we asked for in the letter, as well as if we could get written answers from you to these uh, four questions that I just asked. I certainly would appreciate it. I'm absolutely, absolutely, Thank sir. You. Mr. Chairman, Thank I you. yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, Congresswoman Napolitano for five minutes. Thank you, Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, chair Hamadi, thank you again for visiting California a few weeks ago. And it's nice here seeing you again for the hearing on the Coast Guard safety. But as co-chair of the Mental Health Caucus, I am very concerned about the mental health trauma endured by the victims and their families and the mental health well-being of the NTSB personnel that are constantly dealing with tragedies. Your proposal discusses improved delivery of family assistance 
but can you discuss in which NTSB, how they address mental health trauma the victims and their families go through? And can you discuss what services and training is provided to all NTSB personnel to deal with their own mental health stress and uh, the, the uh, re, uh, related to the work? Uh, how can we assist in this, these uh, challenges? Thank you very, very much, Congresswoman. It was great to see you in California and appreciate your leadership on this issue. We have a family assistance team that is incredibly experienced that deploys uh, to all our major accidents and certain others that fall under our legislation. Uh, and in addition, we provide training for our personnel that is in the field on how to deal with families as well. But that's really the focus of our family assistance team, which has the particular ex expertise. Um, with respect to, I did want to provide, it, certainly going to accidents and incidents for our personnel has an impact on their mental health as well. That is important for the agency. We do provide an employee assistance program and encourage folks to utilize that program. We have had, for example, service or um, uh, uh, animals, compassionate animals for, for care for, for mental health purposes at our accident scenes and have had uh, personnel counselors from our EAP program on our, our more uh, major investigations. But do you have any contact with the Health and Human Services to provide any mental health training to all the NTSB personnel? Uh, we, do, we have our own contracts for uh, providing uh, employee assistance and mental health services for our personnel uh, should they choose to utilize that program. And then we have training for those in the field for dealing with our fam the families of victims and survivors following uh, tragedy. My concern is that some of the employees may be able to spot stress and be able to recommend uh, health services. Anyway, Ms. Uh, uh, Hamani, are there limitations on TSBs? from investigating accidents that happen on private property, such as the rail yards, private modal, intermodal facilities, private airports. And do you have any concerns about being able to fully investigate and receive reporting data regarding the accidents on private property? And what can we do to, to assist in this? I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Congresswoman, I had a little trouble hearing. Private? The limitation on NTSB investigating accidents on private property. Mm. Uh, I, if, you, if you don't mind, Congresswoman, I'd like to get back to you on that for the record and make sure that I get the best information to you on that question. Thank you very much, because uh, I hear from some of the uh, employees of the railroad that they have accidents on private property that they don't report, uh, that we're not aware of. And I'd like mm -hmm. to know if, if that might happen in the intermodal facilities and private airports. If, if for accident investigations, whether it's on public or private property, it, uh, the ones that are reported to the National Response Center for railroads, for example, would get reported to the NTSB. And based on our legislative mandate, we would deploy resources to conduct those investigations. But would you be able to tell whether they're on private property or not? If, if you don't mind, Congresswoman, I'd like to get back to you on that, on that answer. Very much. It's nice to see you again. It's great to uh, see you again, too. Back. Thank you. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes Congressman Davis for five minutes. Oh. Hello, Madam Chair. We meet again. You know, I even got a, 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 a phonetic pronunciation of your name, although I don't need it. Um, I wanted to be able to question you for now many months and, and really, um, really hit you with the hardest hitting questions I possibly can. But you know what? Today, I got to say thank you. Um, we've been friends for a while, spent a lot of time together traveling to eight countries, seven countries in eight days. Uh, we learned a lot and I learned a lot about you. And 
the person you are is somebody that I consider a friend. And I want to say thank you for what you've done. You did personally when we had a, a pipeline spill in Edwardsville, Illinois. You texted me to make sure I knew that the uh, that the NTSB was was on the ground. Your team was on the ground. Your updates were phenomenal. Uh, you put together relevant stakeholders with elected officials. I've heard from Mayor Art Resavi of Edwardsville uh, that his chief concern moving forward, though, is determining the cause of that, that failure so it doesn't happen again. But I want to say publicly thank you. And I'm not usually this nice to witnesses in this committee room, but you deserve it and your team deserves it uh, very much so. But the next time, Madam Chair, you know we're going to have a little more fun, a little more back and forth. But if you want to let the committee know what your, your team did there in Edwardsville, and also uh, is there anything that we can do to insist, assist in your investigation? Well, thank you so much for, certainly for those kind words. Having worked uh, on that side for 14 years, it's much different on this side, I can say. Um, you know, for Edwardsville, I, I do have to uh, not only thank the NTSB team, but also the Marathon Pipeline team. Sean Lyon reached out to me early. We've had numerous conversations. He is a leader when it comes to pipeline safety and in fact invited us to share some information regarding that investigation at their info share uh, with the pipeline uh, industry yesterday. Those are usually closed, more confidential conversations. We were able to talk about some of our concerns regarding soil movement and geological changes and that impact on pipelines and, and how uh, the industry needs to look at that in their integrity management and safety management systems. Uh, so good working relationship, really pleased with that. And we're going to continue to have discussions and see how I can be helpful to him in their operation as well. Did he or anybody on your team give you any indication of when the investigation of that particular Edwardsville pipeline burst might be completed? Uh, I have received indication that it would be next year. Next year? Okay, why? Well, but our pre we do have a preliminary report, which, which we'll make sure to get to your office, and we'll continue to update your office as that moves forward. Well, I appreciate that. And, and again, um, hats off to you and your team and all involved. Uh, I, I appreciate the job that each of you are doing. I appreciate the job you're doing. You. And it's great, to, again, to call you a, a friend and great to call you Madam Chair. And I look forward to continuing to work with you. And, and lastly, I'll just say bravo, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Congressman Cohen for five minutes. Uh, Madam Chair, and, and I thank the chairman and the ranking member for holding this hearing and for our esteemed witness, Chair uh, Homadu. Uh, Tennessee. All over the country, but Tennessee as well had a great number of motor vehicle crashes and deaths um, over the years. It increased, increased, and during COVID, it was worse than ever. Tennessee had a 7% increase in traffic deaths. Uh, 1,217 people lost their lives on the road. Uh, bad times. Uh, National Tra Transportation Safety Board, uh, one time Jim Hall of Tennessee chaired, I think, critical role to play in preventing these crashes. Uh, I've, I've, I've championed this Complete Streets Act, and with Ed Markey in the, in the Senate, and it was provide safe and accessible options for multiple tra travel modes, including people walking, people bicycling, and uh, other, other modes of transportation. And parts of it were in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill, but that didn't make it, uh, our part didn't make it because it was in the House bill, and we took the Senate bill, which was a, a satisfactory, uh, uh, but not pleasing. Uh, what is the your, your attitude about Complete Streets Act and its effect on traffic safety for pedestrians and bicyclists and all those different modes of skateboarding and whatever else they do now. Thank you for the question. I share your concerns about the increase in crashes and traffic deaths on our roads, particularly with respect to best pedestrians and bicyclists, which are now at an astounding more than 7,000 nationally annually. 
and it's only increasing. How we build our roads right now is for efficiency and not for safety, and that has to be the priority. The NTSB does not have a recommendation focused on complete streets. However, we have issued reports on pedestrian safety, bicycle safety, and motorcyclist safety, which really talks about refocusing and incorporating the needs of all road users in design and planning and uh, infrastructure investment. Is that the safe system approach? That's correct. We do endorse the safe system approach. It's on our most wanted list of transportation safety improvements. But you don't have a disparaging word or whatever they say in that song in the West um, about complete streets. We don't have a specific recommendation on complete streets itself. However, we strongly support uh, the safe system approach uh, for uh, eliminating fatalities and serious injuries on our roads. You know, we, we always talk about uh, uh, bicycles and uh, uh, safety and all, and that's important, but we've also got these little feet the micro mobility. Yeah, whatever they whatever they rent and go around on scooters. Uh, has there been uh, birds or whatever they're called, and a couple other companies? Have, have, have they been a large increase in, in accidents and deaths because of those being around? Uh, uh, Congressman, uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to get back to you on the record on uh, fatalities and injuries uh, with respect to scooters and uh, specifically uh, micromobility, but we will uh, circle back on that. There have been increases in pedestrians and bicyclists, for sure. Yeah, well, thank you. Do, do, what do, we, do you have any involvement with the FAA on, on the dealing with, with the 90-second rule of getting people off of airplanes in emergencies? Uh, we do have some recommendations on getting people off aircraft in emergencies, including making sure that um, uh, that occurs promptly. Uh, and I'm happy to provide those recommendations uh, for the record as well. I would love that. You know, we have, I, in 2018, I got in, the, in our transportation bill, a, a uh, uh, might have been the FAA reauthorization, the uh, uh, study of, of seat size and, and, and pitch to see if uh, the continued shrinking of seats and, and pitch made it less likely that they could evacuate a plane in the 90 seconds that is required by law. It was They were required to do a study. Mr. Dixon, on his last day before he absconded from Washington, released the study, which had nobody in the study that they tested. They said, oh, they could get people off in 90 seconds. There was nobody in their study over 60 years of age, nobody with a disability, nobody with a child, nobody pregnant, no pets, nothing like that at all. So it wasn't representative of the flying public. Uh, are you familiar with the, with the, 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 the completely absurd sample that they chose to, to conduct this and why it took them three and a half years to do it? Uh, sir, I'm, I'm not familiar with that study, but it's something I'm pleased to look at and to also look at our recommendations to see if we have uh, uh, recommendations that would address that. I don't believe we do, but I will circle back with you on that. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. You've got such a great reputation and you did a good job, and the FAA totally bungled this. And I don't know if it was because they didn't want to get the answers, but uh, you need to have a representative of the flying public and a proper test. And with that, I deal back the balance of my time. And thank you for your for your continuing work that Jim Hall did for a while. Well, if, if I can, if I can add, sir, Jim Hall still calls me about transportation safety. So he's he, he's sort of a adjunct part of the NTSB still. Good. I've known Andy for over 40, 50 years. Great people. Uh, thank thank you. you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes. Uh, Mr. Weber, four or five minutes. And just as you say that, the bell starts ringing. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate that. And so for Chair Hamadi, I guess my question is the NTS, and I've been on and offline for different reasons today, so I didn't, if this is redundant, forgive me. Why does the NTSB require direct hire authority to hire action investigators and engineers? Well, uh, right now, our uh, process for onboarding personnel can take up to 12 months. In the past, it's taken up to two years. 
And so we would like the ability, because we have a highly skilled workforce, like other agencies, such as the National Air, Air and uh, Space Administration, uh, to direct hire. And we would uh, like that direct hire for three years while we pull together information that's required for the Office of Personnel Management so that we can apply for direct hire authority directly to them. But it would, the authority we're requesting would sunset after three years, and uh, I believe that has been provided to other agencies as well, so there is a model for that. Sure, okay. Uh, you said earlier on in your comments, and I didn't get to hear all of them, I think that when you came on board, uh, the agency was down maybe 20 or 30 employees. Does that sound about right? Uh, that was just in the Office of Aviation Safety. The agency uh, is, had the ability to hire up to 454 and still has that, and we were down in the 300s when I took over. So Today we're at 404, safety. and we have... Um, uh, 13 in the process uh, that have accepted positions and are awaiting uh, or have chosen hiring dates, and we have 21 al already in the process of hiring right now, in addition to that. Thanks. So in the Office of Aviation Safety, speculations, or do you know why, or why do you suspicion that that office was so low? Why the why the attrition, turnover, we'll call it whatever you want, why was that particular office so low? Any ideas? Well, uh, first of all, I'll say that most NTSB employees, if you find one that has worked there for less than 20 years, it would be a miracle. We have people who stay on for decades, and therefore we have a pretty high uh, retirement rate. Right now, 41% uh, of our personnel will be retirement eligible within the next five years, and that's pretty significant. So we're going through a workforce development and planning process right now to ensure success, succession planning. Uh, and I do want to give credit to that to Ms. Darlene Hatchett, who's behind me, who is our principal deputy managing director, for really taking that on, finding efficiencies in our hiring process and moving that forward so we can get personnel on board. Are you are these area specific? Those investigators, you know, West Coast, East Coast, uh, North, South, part of the United States, or how does how do they get allotted to each, an, an investigation, an accident investigation? Uh, right now, we have four regional offices. We have one in Ashburn, Virginia, one in uh, Denver, Colorado, Seattle, Washington, and Anchorage, Alaska. We also have personnel across the United States that are focused on uh, various aspects, whether it's aviation or in our rail office or in our highway office or in marine, uh, and so that we're able to deploy personnel very quickly. And so for our hiring needs, it's really across the board, uh, some at our headquarters and some in the field. Yeah, that's good to know. Okay, well, I'm, I, we appreciate the job y'all do. I know it has to be difficult, heart-wrenching, even heartbreaking at many of these accident scenes. So we appreciate that, Ms. The Madam Chairman. I'm going to yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. And just checking, Mr. Johnson, I think might have dropped off the Zoom. Okay, it looks like he did. Uh, the chair will now recognize uh, Mr. Payne, the chairman of the railroad subcommittee, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, chair Homedy, it's good to see you. Um, <clears throat> and as chairman of the uh, subcommittee on um, railroads, pipelines, and hazardous materials, I have a keen interest in ensuring uh, the timely delivery of the NTSB reports on uh, incident investigations. And with your expertise as the former staff director of this subcommittee, I think you would agree uh, with that statement. Uh, there should not be uh, more than a two year period uh, between rail incidents and the NTSB reports. So I stand ready to work with uh, the NTSB to uh, help you speed up um, the report process. <clears throat> what lessons have you learned since becoming NTSB chair 
about the delay in the rail reports and how can Congress help make this process more efficient? Well, the process is, thank you so much for the question, sir. The process is to improving our ability to get out reports, which needs to be done. Safety can't be improved until those, those uh, reports are out. Although I will say parties to our investigation are aware of information well, of, well in advance of issuance of the reports. From day one, they are part of the investigation. They get the facts so they can take immediate action. With that said, the public needs to know uh, and be aware of our uh, findings, our probable cause, and our recommendations, and take action. And so it is a combination of process improvements internal to the NTSB, which we are all very focused on right now, the entire agency is, and resources. We need additional resources. In rail, we have 11 investigators in rail. In uh, um, uh, pipelines and hazmat, we have six. And so we need additional resources, and I will point out that our, again, that our FY22 number is 121.4. Our request for FY23, which begins our authorization of appropriations request, is 129.3. That entire increase is taken up by a 4.6% pay raise and benefits. And so we need the ability to expand beyond that, to grow, to fill our gaps right now, and that's what we're doing with a hiring surge, but we do also need to put the process improvements on our, in place, which our team is very focused on. So you would say that you're woefully understaffed in these areas, is that fair to say? Our, our team is top notch. They do a lot with a little, and they work around the clock, but it does have an impact and uh, they, they will do what they need to do and continue to do it because they are very mission focused. That is the reason why they stay so long. But they also need us to invest in them, otherwise they get burnt out and they leave. They need right. our support and that's why we're here requesting that. So yes, we need your help. Okay. Um, as a part of NTA, BS's authorization proposal, I'm pleased to see uh, an emphasis on recruiting a diverse workforce from uh, underserved communities. I'm uh, in strong support of this proposal and believe that uh, tomorrow's workforce will be comprised of the brightest minds, no matter their zip code. Can you um, elaborate more on the NTSB's proposed actions to reach underserved communities and how we'll recruit from them. Yes, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first and foremost, we have two strategic plans that we've implemented in compliance with the executive orders that were issued to uh, increase diversity, uh, equity, uh, accessibility, um, uh, and diverse, uh, I'm sorry, inclusion in the workforce. We're hiring a chief human capital officer. We're implementing recruitment plans. We're identifying and deploying strategies to hire and retain a diverse and inclusive workforce. We're promoting paid internships. Uh, we're improving leadership and development to, un to ensure that our hiring managers are prepared and best trained to know how to attract and retain a diverse workforce. And we're also looking at accessibility, but beyond internal, we're looking external. We're looking at, out, at communities that we don't normally work with to outreach and focus with uh, our safety advocacy work. So other communities that don't we have not traditionally worked with can hear about the safety issues that we're most concerned about and work with them to hear the issues they're also most concerned about. In addition to that, we have to uh, 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 work on offering our products in other languages. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I would suggest if, if it hasn't been, but it might have already um, been thought of, um, our veterans at service. The gentleman's um, time has expired. Might be a good pool to look at. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. LaMalfa for five minutes. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's good to see you, Chair Helmady. Thank you. Good to see you, too. Um, thanks for appearing with us here today. And I was just hearing about DEI a second ago. Wasn't that being applied to crash test dummies in a conversation a little bit ago or not? I'm sorry? I thought I heard uh, DEI being applied to crash test dummies here a few minutes ago. Is that true? Uh, you don't have to touch that one. Don't forget that one. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you never know what you're going to hear. So um, l let me ask before my other questions was, what is the overlap and responsibility with, uh, on airlines with NTSB and FAA as far as passenger comfort, passenger handling, or even rowdy passengers like we're hearing these days? And does that enter even into the uh, conversation on mask mandates and the things that are, you know, all these things that are causing irritability with passengers these days? Yeah, thank you for that question. We are only involved in accidents and incidents right. and evaluating those. We are not involved with um, airline operations or the work of the FAA regarding those issues unless for some reason they come up in an accident or incident investigation. Yeah, okay. I thought that would be good for on the record for people to understand what, what the clear roles are. Uh, br briefly talking about the budget situation here, and this is something i got to ask since we're, you know, stewards of taxpayers and so we're uh, we're looking at you know you mentioned current year 124 124 million current year is 121.4 121 okay and so what we're looking at in the proposal here is 129 and 23 145 24 155 in fiscal year 25 and 165 26 175 in 27 so that that's a jump of my numbers are halfway right between 23 through 27 of about 35 percent is that commensurate with other funding increases you're seeing in other agencies or other priorities for the federal government? They've actually gotten more over the years. We've had much lower increases over the years. And in fact, we have the same level of full-time equivalent personnel as we, have it, as we had in 1998. We have had increases in our funding, of course, but most 70% of our budget goes towards pay and benefits. And, you know, so we need additional uh, investment, not just in our workforce, but also IT investments. We had a mandate in the last reauthorization bill to develop a multimodal database for accidents and incidents, something that is critical, but it was unfunded. And so we, we did uh, uh, finance that and we moved it forward, but we need additional funding to improve it and man maintain it. We're going to have to plan for cybersecurity and other uh, contingencies over the next several years. Will you see enough for this um, equipment side of it, not just personnel? Is that going to reflect being able to upgrade your equipment and technology then? Uh, this reauthorization proposal is modest. It's not everything we need. In order to get everything we need that was submitted uh, as part of the reauthorization effort uh, to uh, the Office of the Chair and the Managing Director, it would require an investment of about $250 million annually. So this is modest. It's okay. what we thought would be reasonable that we could move forward with. Okay, appreciate that. Let me shift gears to uh, private aircraft and some of the issues there. Of course, I have a very large rural district, decent amount of private aircraft as well as crop dusters and like that. Uh, would you talk about any recommendations you might have your agency would be looking at on, on rural aircraft usage, whether it is something more business-like like crop dusting or general purpose uh, private aviation, private aircraft? Is, what, do you, what do you see as needing to be improved or focused for you? Well, there are definitely improvements in general aviation with respect to uh, safety and uh, accident rates over the last several years. We're about a little over 1,000 annually in general aviation accidents, but that has gone down, which is significant, and a large part not just from the community, but our focus on safety and improving safety for uh, general aviation. Uh, I would have to, uh, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to get back to you uh, with some of our specific recommendations in rural areas with, okay. with aircraft and crop dusters and happy to do that for the record. Okay, thank you. It's really important in my area. So um, how is it when you have investigations that involve the state as well as NTSB, what kind of cooperation level are you getting with states? Is it, is it difficult? It's kind of, I kind of get the impression... We have difficulty sometimes with states and cooperation and sharing of info, et cetera. 
Our biggest difficulties incur, uh, occur in highway safety, especially where we don't have an established relationship. We try to establish those relationships in advance by the, either the board members or office uh, staff going out and developing those relationships with law enforcement. That's critical. Uh, but it can um, be an issue on the ground. Our legislative proposal or our mandate right now states that when we conduct a highway investigation, it has to be in cooperation with the state. In the past, some states like New York have taken that uh, to mean, they've argued that we can't pursue our safety investigation until they're through their criminal investigation, which is not accurate and not in accordance with our mandate. Now, fortunately, the courts have ruled against that position uh, and uh, in our favor, which has been helpful, but we're, we are asking for some clarification in our reauthorization proposals so that we can move forward and clear up any sort of issues. Yeah. But we do try to work very closely with the states and with law enforcement. Yeah, it would Gentlemen's seem, time it would has seem expired. to seem that already have that relationship. But Gentlemen's time has it. expired. Mr. Carvajal, the Coast Guard Service Committee Chair, you're recognized, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Hammondy, it is a pleasure to see you again. I personally want to thank you for coming to Santa Barbara last month to review the Coast Guard's effort to improve small passenger vessel safety in response to the deadly or a number of deadly boat incidences, including the tragic Conception boat fire in my district. I know the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, has an important role in investigating incidents and issuing recommendations so similar catastrophes do not occur in the future. Having seen firsthand how these recommendations can guide Congress in ensuring the safety of, of the American people when traveling in different modes of transportation, I understand the importance of the NTSB. As we look towards reauthorizing the NTSB, can you discuss the types of resources you need from Congress to support your mission in maybe a little bit more detail than you've done already. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding that hearing and for uh, your work, really bipartisan effort over the past few weeks to move the uh, Don Young Coast Guard Reauthorization Act. We really appreciate the bipartisan, bipartisan effort to move that as you implemented a num or mandated a number of NTSB recommendations, including longstanding recommendations regarding the duck boats, which goes back to 1999 uh, uh, with a, a terrible tragedy. And so we really appreciate your work supporting the NTSB. Essentially, the NTSB, we have some uh, policy improvements that we would like to make. Some of our reauthorization proposal can be self-implementing, but we are transparent and want you to know where we're headed. However, we need resources. We need additional resources with equipment. We need additional resources in terms of personnel. And uh, we really appreciate your support over the years. Our, our workforce is truly incredible. I am always impressed with the work that they do do with very little, uh, um, with, with very little. And so as uh, investigations become even more complex, your support uh, in terms of resources would be really appreciated. Thank you, Chair Hammondy. Uh, another issue that I am interested in hearing from you is in regard to rail quiet zones or the impact that they've had or not on rail safety. As you might know, many localities have established quiet zones in their communities. Uh, when I was in local government, this issue would come up from time to time. Has NTSB issued any safety recommendations around quiet zones to balance noise pollution and safety? And what has been the implications or not of um, quiet zone programs, legislation in the past uh, when it comes to safety? Yeah, thank you for the question. I would have to go back to our rail personnel and provide that for the record on what recommendations we might have with respect to quiet zones. I know it is a, a uh, hot topic for the committee as it's something I worked on uh, previously when I worked for the committee. So I understand how it's important to, how important it is to each of you and happy to provide that um, uh, for the record. 
Thank you. I know it's a balancing act, trying to provide quiet zones uh, for mitigating noise for communities, but at the same time, uh, addressing and keeping a balance with promoting safety. So it's just an area that I'm always interested in learning more about because these continue to be issues in various communities, including my district. And it's always nice to hear what, what the pros and cons are of them as it relates to safety issues, at least uh, looked into or considered by NTSB. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Gentleman had yields. Uh, next we have Mr. Jimenez, you recognize, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Ms. Hamandi, uh, yeah, I also noticed that uh, you, you asked for closely about 35% increase in the next five years for your, for your agency. Uh, you said you have 454, um, I guess, approved positions uh, in your agency. You only have 404 right now. Um, are, those, uh, are those 454 FTEs or FTE equivalents? What, what are they? So the FTEs, we have 412 right now for FTEs, but what we're doing is overhiring anticipation of retirements. And uh, in the past, since January 1st, we've had 11 retirements already. And as people return to work, because our agency is now back to work, we expect there will be more. Uh, by, the end, by, the, by the end of the five years where you're, you're asking for another $45 million in, in, uh, in funding, are you going to be increasing the number of FTEs? We will be increasing the number of people on board up to where that would provide us, uh, barring any other contingencies with, uh, you know, uh, let me get back to you on the exact number that we would end up with at the end of the five years. Can you give me for a the record? Can you give me a, an estimate? It's about uh, 480. 480, okay. In the last five years, have you had a significant increase in the number of investigations that you've been conducting? We have had an increase in aviation investigations, and I would have to look at the investigations in the other modes as well. What, can you give me an estimate of what percentage increase you've had in investigations? I, I would have to get back to you on the record for yeah, that. Yeah, could you please? I would, I would certainly appreciate that. Um, as we look at your funding funding request. Um, going to uh, commercial space, uh, it's uh, you, NTSB uh, uh, conducts investigations on commercial space um, issues, accidents, et cetera. Who conducts investigations on NASA incidents? On, uh, on NASA, NASA yeah. we, I mean, we do have a memorandum of understanding with NASA to do uh, uh, some investigations at their request, but um, we have done uh, commercial and in space investigations since 1993, starting with Pegasus. No, I know, I know you do commercial, but uh, who does NASA? Does NASA does do, NASA does NASA? Is that what they do? NASA, and we have worked with them as well. Right. Are the procedures for NASA investigations any different from the ones that you are proposing for commercial space flight? No, uh, I, I am not familiar with NASA's procedures, but our procedures are no different than any other investigation that we already conduct with respect to the party system and uh, working with the operators and working with the federal agencies closely. I know that the, I'm hearing that the, the, some of the commercial space operators have issues with, with some of your rules. So I guess my question again is, are your rules concerning investigations different one from that from NASA uses to investigate its own issues? I think the commercial uh, space industry uh, is, not, is not as familiar with the operations of the NTSB, which is why I'm currently meeting with the different operators so I can familiarize us with our process. Some are better informed and some have worked with us for many years, but we have had 30 years of uh, expertise in this area and have worked with FAA and NASA to develop a close working relationship and with many of the operators. Have you had a, a, a work, have you communicated with NASA about your, your rules and are they in favor of those rules? Are they in agreement with those rules? I can't speak for NASA, but I have uh, spoken with them and we, we participate on a quad chair working group with NASA 
and the Air Force and FAA and meet quarterly with them and have discussed this and other measures that, including our MOU over the years. Are NASA rockets any different than commercial rockets? I, I would have to defer that question to our investigators. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Malamowski, you are uh, recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Madam Chair, welcome, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to use my time to today to talk about trucks and trucking and safety. Um, like many of us, I'm concerned about the shortage of, uh, of truck drivers in America today, the impact that that is having on our supply chain challenges. We all know there are many reasons for the shortage, um, everything from an aging workforce to an agent to a, a workforce with high uh, turnover, uh, a job that's hard, that involves it. A job that involves time away from, uh, from family, um, training certification requirements, in many cases low pay. Um, but certainly one of the reasons for the shortage that I think doesn't get enough attention uh, is treatment of drivers by, by management, specifically the demands that are put on them, uh, some of them at least, to continue to drive when they're too tired to do so safely. Um, as we've done before uh, in, in this committee, I, I turned uh, for support to one of our informal T&I advisors, John Oliver of HBO, uh, who did a segment on this uh, recently uh, he told a story of a truck driver who was forced to take his mandatory break during the day when he couldn't sleep and forced to drive at night when he was obviously too tired uh, to do so. Uh, the driver knew this wasn't right, so he recorded his co a conversation that he had with his dispatchers. Um, and I wanted to, if technology permitting, play that exchange for us today. So let's see if this works. Hey, man, we got a bit of a problem, dude. I'm starting to fall asleep going down the road here. But get a load of this. The k and dispatchers, instead of telling him to just get some rest, hot potato aim from one dispatcher to another, each of them with the same advice. Yeah, call me and then let's... Okay, we don't have a, we don't have a choice on this. Yeah, get coffee, walk around the truck, do something. I already did that earlier, man. Let's go. Get some fresh air. That, that, uh, what is it, about 10 degrees outside? Yeah. Did you get the gist of that, or was it hard to, yeah? Basically... A little bit hard to hear. Yeah, he's saying he's not safe to drive at the moment. Um, they're telling him, you know, just go out, take a walk, get a cup of coffee. He said, I think I'm going to hurt somebody. And they say, we don't have time for that bullshit. That's not how we work here uh, at, um, at K&B. So look, it's one anecdote. Um, but we know that NTSB has looked back at... Um, a sample of its major investigations across various modes of transportation and found that a full 20% of them identified fatigue as a major contributing factor to accidents. And in the highway-related investigations, you all found fatigue was present in 40% of them. I know that NTSB first recommend, made recommendations to address the safety risks associated with fatigue 50 years ago, 1972. So my question excuse me to you, is are we better off than we were 50 years ago? Um, and what are some of the most important outstanding recommendations from NTSB related to driver fatigue that have yet to be implemented? Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I would love, first, before I answer the question, I would like to get back to you with our recommendations on fatigue, because we have many, including for commercial truck drivers. And it's been on our most wanted list in the past as a serious safety issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, we, we do have recommendations on hours of service and electri electronic logbooks. We always look at hours of service as part of any of our investigations and have found uh, significant concerns regarding scheduling and the impact on that of 
of that scheduling on commercial drivers. So I'm happy to get, get you specific recommendations for the record. Uh, thank you so much. And in particular, recommendations that have not yet been implemented. been implemented by agencies. And of course, separately, if you feel that Congress needs to take additional actions. Yep, there are many. We will get those to you. Thank you so much. And I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, we'll have Ms. Steele, followed by Mr. Stanton and Mr. Burchett. Ms. Steele, you're on for five minutes. Mr. Burchett, you're on for five minutes, sir. Thank you, Chair Lady. Um, I suppose y'all can tell by my accent, I'm probably not um, Northeasterner. I'm just um, from Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm over here to your right, ma'am. Right here. You see me? Okay, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's all right. I try to do live, live action, as you <laughs> say. Um, I try to do live too. So. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you for being here, and I want to um, thank those folks behind you. I know they, they got to just be sitting here, you know, in mindless wander this whole time having to listen to all this. So I appreciate y'all very much too. Y'all don't get any credit that y'all are. are um, putting up with a lot just by having to sit here all day. So thank you all as well. But I, I've listened to your testimony and I've listened to everybody else, but I guess what I'm concerned is, is that um, the barriers that I think that are entry for folks looking to join the National Traffic Safety Board um, workforce. And I'm wondering, is there a skills gap involved with that? I, I say that, I said I, I was, uh, not educated in the Northeast, I was educated at the University of Tennessee and I have a degree in technological adult education. So skills seem to be where it's at right now. And, I, and, and it has been continuously and it seems to be even more so now. And I was wondering if you could address that issue. Yes, thank you very much. And, and we do have plenty of people who apply at the NTSB and want to work for the NTSB. Part of it is our process in getting people in the door. And we do have a process or a program in place where we work with Pathways, which are recent college graduates to get them in the door and then train them up to be investigators. You have a number of great universities, including the University of Ten Tennessee and Middle Tennessee University, folks that I've talked to uh, on aerospace and aviation. And so I would encourage recent graduates to go to the Pathways program because I, uh, or the NTSB and other federal agencies utilize them and try to get them in the door and um, uh, up to speed on uh, a lot of our processes. Thank you. Let me change gears a little bit um, on that. I'm wondering how many of the um, National Traffic Safety Board employees that are in mission, mission critical or essential occupations were forced to leave their jobs last year because of the president's uh, vaccine mandate for federal workers? I, I would, I, I'd like to get back to you for the record on that number. I, I don't believe I don't believe we had anyone leave because of that, but I want to be sure that I accurately answer that and provide that for the record. Okay, I'd really appreciate that. One last thing, um, how do you think the reauthorization proposal, it'll, how do you think it's gonna help you recruit enough skilled workers to fill those positions and avoid future workforce shortage? That's a great question. Right now, uh, we are working with the Office of Personnel Management on a Strategic Human Capital Plan. We are in the process of hiring a Chief Human Capital Officer, as the NTSB has not had one at an SES level in the past. And we are working on a uh, succession plan and gap analysis to ensure that we're prepared for the future, that we're hiring the, uh, the right personnel. In addition, we have a training center right now and are working to refocus the training center on career development and investment in training in our workforce, which to enable our employees to each have an individual uh, training plan so that they have core skills and that they have uh, advanced uh, training as they continue on throughout their career. Madam Chair, I'm going to yield back the rest of my time, but thank you so much for being here and for answering our questions. 
I don't, um, I guess I don't share the infatuation that my friend Rodney Davis does with you, but I'm sure if we spent enough time that I would. So thank you so much, ma'am, for being, for answering these questions. If you, and if you could please get back to me on that other one. I will. Thank, thank you, Thank you sir. so much, ma'am. Chair Lady, I yield back to you. Gentlemen, yields back. And, and I want to note that you are always very well dressed and, and exceptionally well dressed, ma'am. I just thank want to you, compliment sir. you on that. Thank you very much. And I must compliment you on the question about education. And I have asked uh, at the hearing that we had in Santa Barbara to uh, give us the names of the universities you outreach to because we'd like to help with the recruitment. Absolutely. Chair, Chair Lady, it doesn't help you in, in our caucus if you compliment me. It usually helps if you say something derogatory towards me, I've noticed. So no way. You. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next, we'll, uh, gentleman yields back. Uh, next member is uh, Representative Stanton. You're re recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I want to welcome Chair Homedy. Uh, I want to thank you and all of the dedicated employees at the National Transportation Safety Board for your steadfast commitment to improving the safety of our transportation system. The NTS NTSB currently has a number of active investigations in my home state of Arizona, including the Union Pacific train derailment, which occurred in my district in 2020. I look forward to seeing the board's final report and recommendation, hopefully later this year. The NTSB is charged with investigating civil aviation accidents in the United States and providing safety recommendations to prevent future accidents. Black box data recorders, which capture the voice and data during a flight are critical to providing insights into the cause of aircraft accidents. The current requirement in the United States is for recorders to record just two hours of flight time meaning anything over two hours is overwritten and not accessible. Europe, on the other hand, has implemented a requirement for recorders on commercial aircraft to cover 25 uh, hours. What is NTSB's position uh, on this issue? I, I believe we are supportive of that proposal and I would like to get back to to you on the record to make sure it's the right recommendation that I'm responding to. But data recorders are critical. They're critical not just for accident investigation, but they're critical for the operators themselves to determine if there are safety deficiencies after an accident occurs. And that's where the biggest uh, safety uh, uh, measures can be addressed immediately. So I appreciate that. Also, uh, just to respond on the rail accident you mentioned in Tempe, uh, our rail personnel, I checked with them before coming to the hearing and they uh, mentioned that they believe that investigation will be completed this year. Thank you very much. Are there instances where the two hour record of data has been insufficient for the NTS NTSB's needs in the course of investigation? I, uh, Congressman, I'd like to get back to you on that, on that question for the record and check with our Office of Aviation Safety. Please do, thank you very much. And can you speak to the importance of data collection um, and the role it plays in an investigation and to the NTSB's ability to identify potentially systemic concerns and mitigate future accidents? Uh, it's very critical to have that information, not just for accident investigation, but as I said, for the operator and for the FAA to determine if there are any d safety deficiencies that need to be addressed immediately after a accident or incident. So that information is critical. I will say we have um, other recommendations, including for helicopter manufacturers, uh, on crash resistant recorders, which we've recommended for numerous years that the FAA has failed to implement. And th so we reissued those to the manufacturers uh, themselves uh, to ensure that they're uh, in helicopters to help us not only in investigations, but identifying safety gaps. Thank you, I look forward to uh, getting the swift response to the answers they weren't able to answer immediately here today. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and we have the next uh, uh, member, Ms. Gonzalez Colon. You recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning to our witness today. Um, I, I just have a few questions, and one of them is coming from a territory. Uh, sometimes uh, we ask ourselves how long it's going to take 
uh, for your office to, to investigate or to respond to a maritime issue or a plane crash in Puerto Rico or more distant territories like American Samoa? Yeah, thank you for uh, that question. When we are notified of an accident, uh, it goes through our response operations center and the personnel there are on duty 24 hours a day and constantly monitoring information that comes in. They notify our duty officer and then immediately we begin to uh, gather information around the accident and incident. When we're able to deploy, we do have access to the FAA planes out of national, and then we have other uh, personnel throughout the United States that can uh, be on the ground fairly quickly. How, how are investigators forward stationed uh, to ensure there's a timely and rapid response in those cases? Uh, we have investigators for all modes of transportation in various parts of the United States. We have four regional offices, one in Anchorage, one in Seattle, one in Ashburn, Virginia, and one in Denver, Colorado. But then we also have another of, a number of investigators across all modes of, of uh, transportation in the NTSB that work throughout the United States in various states. And so we do have the ability to send many of those in advance, even if it's not their mode of transportation, to be the first person on scene. Thank you. Uh, I know uh, your office and the Coast Guard updated their work uh, MOU on June of last year. Um, I would love to know your words in terms of how important you think it is to institutionalize those best practices that have been developed in the wake of tragedies like El Faro uh, in the Caribbean area. I, I have to say that we have an excellent working relationship with the United States Coast Guard. Uh, that relationship didn't always exist, but we worked really hard on both sides uh, to get a close working relationship and develop the most recent memorandum of understanding. The leadership there has been phenomenal and partners with us, and we partner with them on many investigations. We work closely together. We were in... Uh, off uh, the coast of Santa Barbara working together on the Conception dive boat tragedy, which uh, Chair Napolitano had mentioned, but others as well, and we continue to work together. I greatly support their efforts. They do a lot with a very, very little, as does the NTSB. Can you uh, describe briefly the type of equipment or technology that your office use uh, and the one that you may need, uh, that may, you may not have it at this time, uh, just for me to understand it, and there's a way that members of Congress can do tour of your district office here. Yeah, our technology, and I'd love to get you a list because we do have a long list of our technology needs, but technology in general, we have more complex investigations right now, so we're going to need additional resources in terms of technological improvements for our research and engineering staff. That includes, as, and you've mentioned a lot on marine safety, that includes in marine safety. And just to add, our workforce in marine safety, they, their workload has increased eightfold in the past decade, but their staffing is pretty low. They have uh, 20 staff right now and 11 investigators just for marine safety. In all nation. It, just for marine safety. Yeah, and they've requested an additional 17. And so as you see, they, there are needs uh, for the Marine Safety Office and across the agency and uh, across the board. How, how do you think, I mean, how much uh, your workload increased during the last you know, few years? I mean, it's been Oh, uh, tremendously, and it's changing because we have new technologies right now, whether it's automated vehicles or um, uh, driving uh, driver assistance systems right now that we're evaluating, or new tech, new avionics and aircraft. We're talking about drone ships now, mm -hmm. and so it is becoming more complex. And it's not just the technologies in terms of vehicles and vessels; it's in terms of new uh, fuel sources. So we had just done a report and investigation on. Uh, uh, high crash, uh, the impact of lithium ion battery fires on emergency responders following high impact crashes. 
and found that there wasn't enough information for emergency responders and that NHTSA had to do additional res research. Whenever we're moving towards these new technologies, whether it's a vehicle or vessel or new fuel source, we have to remember that we're also evaluating and have to make it a priority to evaluate the safety of those systems. Thank the you. Ladies' time has expired. Yeah, I yield back. Thank you, she yields back. We have uh, Representative Garcia, followed by Mr. Williams and Mr. Lowenthal. Mr. Garcia, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And of course, I want to thank Chair uh, DeFazio. And of course, uh, thank you, Chair Hamendi, for appearing today. So we've made significant progress over the past uh, few decades in making our transportation system safer, except our roadways. Fatalities on our roadways actually increased in recent years. In 2020, 38,824 people died in traffic crashes in the U.S. This is the highest number since 2007. I want to highlight a mind-boggling statistics. More Americans died in car crashes from 2000 to 2019 than the combined total number of Americans who died in World War I and World War II. Speeding is one of the top two causes of traffic crashes. According to the National Traffic Highway Safety Administration, speeding was a contributing factor in 26% of all traffic fatalities in 2019. Uh, Chair Hamendi, um, most jurisdictions in the U.S. Uh, set speed limits using what's known as the 85th percentile speed. NTSB has recommended that the 85th, 85th percentile speed be phased out. Can you explain what the 85th percentile speed is and why the NTSB recommends it be phased out? Yes, thank you for that, that question. And speeding is a significant concern as uh, 10,000 fatalities on our roads are attributed to uh, speeding annually. The 85th percentile is something we focused on in a number of our investigations, including some of our vulnerable road user reports. What it means is that uh, states, when they're evaluating speed limits and the adequacy of speed limits, they're looking at what 80, 85% of the traffic is traveling at, and then they set the speed limit within five miles per hour of that number. Frankly, that uh, method for determining and setting speed limits goes back to the 1950s. So we're setting speed limits based on uh, uh, 1950s era uh, uh, configuration or um, it, it, what it is not looking at is how our roads are being used. It doesn't look at uh, pedestrians or uh, bicyclists or motorcyclists. It just sets it on an arbitrary number. And what ends up happening is over time, speed limits increase. So now we have speed limits as high as 85 miles per hour in the United States, which has a significant impact, even more impact, not just on drivers, but on vulnerable road users. And this recommendation to stop using the 85th percentile speed to set speed limits applies to all types of roadways, correct? That's right, it's not just on interstates. That 85th percentile yeah. applies, it's a one size fits all approach. It's the engineering rule of thumb in the US right now where they're setting speed limits on the highways just like they're setting speed limits on local roads. Although there has been a move yes. recently to turn that over to local and municipal jurisdiction, which is a good thing. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, the NTSB has recommended uh, that we use instead what's called a safe uh, systems approach to road safety. This is something that was a prominent policy in Chairman DeFazio's Investag. Can you explain what a safe systems approach is to road safety and why that's the recommended approach? Yeah, in the past few decades, thank you for the question. In the past few decades, we've really focused on education enforcement, which isn't gonna get us very far. We need a comprehensive, holistic approach to address road safety and uh, look at how, we're, how we design our roads, how those roads are designed for use. In the past, we've looked at, we've focused on the design of roads on efficiency, on getting people from A to v, B and not for safety and how they are being used. 
In addition, we need to look at safe vehicles. That's part of the safe system approach and implementing technology on vehicles that can save lives like automatic emergency braking and forward collision warning. Certainly we're not saying education and enforcement isn't part of the holistic approach, it is, but other parts of the system also need, are critical and need to play an equal, uh, need an equal share of, um, uh, of addressing fatalities and serious injuries on our roads. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Stauber, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair. Um, I see that the NTSB's most wanted list for transportation and safety improvements, uh, the NTSB, includes pipeline leak mitigation as a priority. You, you know, we have all seen the stories and the near tragedies that involve incidents where pipeline protesters and anti-jobs and anti-energy activists have gone out to pipelines to cause damage to the pipeline and the environment they claim to support. We saw many incidents in my district when they failed to stop the Enbridge Line 3 replacement project. Valve turning incidents and even cases of protesters shooting pipelines with guns are extremely concerning, especially since these very criminals see little to no jail time. Ms. Hamadi, the NTSB is prioritizing pipeline leak mitigation. What specifically in the NTSB is the NTSB doing to combat these violent protesters from co committing acts of environmental terrorism on the pipelines and putting so many people's lives at risk? Thank you for the question. When it comes to uh, criminal activities, the NTSB, if we determine that an accident or incident is criminal in nature, we have an MOU with the FBI and turn over those criminal matters over to the Federal Bureau of Inve Investigation. Do you, when you, uh, if you, that MOU, does it, does it describe, um, does it give the um, FBI the jurisdiction to uh, lessen the crime or reduce the sentence? Uh, I, the, the MOU is just geared towards our activities and our work with the FBI and when we would turn over criminal matters and what resources they would help the NTSB on any sort of, on any of our investigations. Would you agree that pipeline protesters and anti-jobs and anti-energy activists who are doing this to pipelines put not only themselves, the environment, but the workers themselves at risk? Uh, that, it, it's not an issue I have been focused on uh, and happy to get back to you on that. Okay, but you're aware of the pipeline protesters? I am aware of pipeline protesters, yes. Wh which, which protesting pipelines are you aware of then? Uh, there have been numerous ones over the past several years of protests, including TransCanada, Keystone Pipeline. Right. How about uh, Enbridge Energy Replacement Line 3? Are you aware of those protesters? I, I am aware that there are objections, yes. Objections or protesters? Or protesters. Okay. What do you think it, co what do you think it costs the local communities to um, safeguard, prepare, defend, and charge these uh, anti-jobs, anti-energy activists? What do you think it costs the local communities? I don't know the answer to that, sir. Is that something that uh, you should consider in working your MOU with the FBI? Um, if you think it's a serious enough crime, and, and, and do you think it's a serious enough crime? The NTSB does not have jurisdiction over criminal matters. We have jurisdi jurisdiction over accidents and incidents as defined in our law. Is, is an incident a, a protester? If it is criminal in nature, it would not be under our jurisdiction. So what you're saying is the NTSB um, refers everything to the FBI? If it's criminal in nature. Okay. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, I will share with you in case you don't know, uh, Enbridge Line 3 came through part of our district. Uh, we had protesters inside the pipe while it was being raised. Uh, workers were put um, in uh, serious jeopardy for their safety. Uh, it taxed the local law enforcement community. In fact, they had to uh, bring in uh, more law enforcement to secure uh, the uh, appropriate area. And I hope that the NTSB, as you go forward, uh, uh, Madam, I hope that you would look into uh, the fact that the NTSB uh, should weigh in heavily 
on these uh, anti-jobs, anti-energy protesters, which is affecting communities across this nation. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. We have Mr. Ms. Williams from Georgia, followed by Ms. Steele. Ms. Williams, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. From travelers using the world's busiest and most efficient airport to folks getting where they need to go with the nation's eighth largest rapid transit system to drivers navigating our busy roads, y'all Georgia's fifth congressional district is always on the move. And a lot of people on the move means a lot of people that we need to keep safe. That's why the work of the National Transportation Safety Board is so important, especially in my district. A small but mighty agency, the board investigates transportation accidents and helps prevent future accidents from happening. To ensure the board truly serves us is up to Congress to make sure that we provide it the resources and the support that it needs. Today, I look forward to hearing from Chair Hamendi that how we can do that through reauthorization. Chair Hamendi, according to the board's data, investigating a highway accident takes an average of 18 months and investigating aviation accidents takes an average of 19 months. In your reauthorization proposal, are there specific resources or supports that ensure that the board can provide the most efficient thorough assessments possible to guide timely investigations and subsequent safety recommendations? Thank you very much for the question and, and uh, thank you for your leadership on safety. The NTSB is very focused on reducing our backlog of investigations and improving the timeliness of issuing our accident reports. Part of that is through dedicating the appropriate resources and part of that is through uh, implementing process improvements which we have done at the agency. As far as resources, we need to fill the gaps. Right now, we have a number of vacancies that we need to fill that have been, uh, quite frankly, on the books for some time, and we're working diligently to do that. But then we also need to expand our resources. With respect to the timeliness in particular, not only have we put certain processes in place, but we've added a couple of personnel, some former employees from the NTSB who are retired annuitants who will be solely focused on the backlog in aviation. We're doing very well on the backlog in, in other modes. Uh, in some modes, it's non-existent. So we are working and making significant improvement and would appreciate um, your consideration of our reauthorization proposal, which would provide us a moderate, modest increase in resources and personnel, uh, to, which would help us uh, improve the timeliness of our accident investigations. Thank you. Additionally, the National Transportation Safety Board's most wanted list recommends protecting vulnerable road users through a safe systems approach. We've heard witnesses testify in previous hearings about the safe systems approach as an alternative way states and localities can address traffic safety. Could you elaborate on how the safe system approach promotes more equitable and effective traffic safety enforcement? And how would your reauthorization proposal support this approach? The NTSB has on its most wanted list of transportation safety improvements, imp uh, vulnerable road, improving the safety of vulnerable road users through the safe system approach. We've implemented, or we've issued a number of reports, pedestrian safety, bicyclist safety, and motor so motorcyclist safety, focused on improving their safety on our nation's roads. And within that, we have hundreds of recommendations uh, that still requires implementation. Everything from improving safety on our roads to how they're designed, how they're built, uh, to ensure that they are built for the use of all road users, not just vehicles, uh, to looking at improving the safety of vehicles themselves. So we do endorse the safe system approach and are working hard uh, to promote that through all our actions at the NTSB. Thank you. And in addition to that, re reducing inequalities and creating opportunities for diversity and inclusion is something that I also take just as serious as safety. So as your agency focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion to create a more talented workforce, what impact would a broader range of perspectives that the agency have on ensuring potential safety issues are identified and reported? 
Uh, well, with respect to impact, it would be tremendous. And just, just so you are aware, part of our core values is diversity and inclusion. And we have uh, begun to implement two strategic plans focused on uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, including uh, retaining, uh, hiring, and attracting a diverse uh, workforce, which is critical to the NTSB, critical to our investigation, because people who bring different experiences, different thought, different uh, backgrounds help in our investigations and in all our work at the NTSB. And while I do have more questions, I am unfortunately out of time. So Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman needs back. Uh, we will recognize Ms. Steele, followed by Mr. Lowenthal, Mr. Cedars. Ms. Steele, you have, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you very much. Madam Chairwoman, the um, National Transportation Safety Board plays an important role on investigating transportation accidents. And I want to commend the work that NTSB has done in my district, especially with the recent fatal helicopter crash of a Huntington Beach officer, Nicholas Bella. The NTSB also plays an important role in providing safety recommendations to federal and state agencies. Unfortunately, both alcohol impaired and drug impaired driving deaths have become a common issue in Orange County. As you know, drug impaired driving is very difficult to detect compared to alcohol impaired driving. How is the NTSB improving drug testing protocol? And what are some of the lessons learned from the past accident? Thank you for the question. Ending drug and alcohol and alcohol impairment is on our most wanted list of transportation safety improvements. And in fact, we have a pretty comprehensive uh, report coming out this fall focused on uh, uh, drug impaired driving, and we'll make sure to brief you on that. But we have several recommendations, including uh, uh, improving drug testing, setting a standard. Uh, to determine impairment like we have with alcohol. That's not something the NTSB does. It's something we recommend and have issued recommendations both uh, to the Department of Transportation, and I believe we've also uh, issued recommendations to the Department of Health uh, and Human Services as well. Thank you very much. With the emerging transportation technologies, including commercial space, unmanned aircraft systems, and even autonomous vehicles. How are you collaborating with the commercial stakeholders in these transforming sectors in support of NTSB's broader mission of improving transportation safety? Thank you for the question. We have tremendous outreach with uh, the commercial community, uh, whether it's through speaking with uh, different um, organizations visiting their sites or uh, uh, speaking at events they have or participating in work groups uh, where we work together on emerging safety issues and discuss those openly, including what we're seeing in accidents and incidents and trends in safety and transportation. So we work very closely with them. And then in our accident investigations, uh, if an operator uh, is, is if, it, if, if something occurred with that operator, the operator more than likely would be provided party status, which means they would be part of our fact-finding portion of the investigation. We would work closely together, and they would be able to identify safety gaps immediately that they could address. So when those reports are going to come out, is that right now that you are going through the process? I'm, I'm sorry, it was difficult to hear. It, when this report is gonna come out that you are putting all these informations together after all these meetings, are we gonna expect by end of this year or you know next few months and some like a progress report is gonna come out? Uh, with respect, I'm sorry, with respect to drug testing and impairment or just our work with uh, private entities? 
private entities regarding unmanned aircraft systems and then autonomous vehicles. And these are actually creating a lot of accidents too, hopefully not. But these report has to be done. And is that coming up from the your agency or not? Well, we, we work on individual accident investigations, and we do have certain accident investigations right now uh, involving urban air mobility or advanced air mobility and involving uh, driver assistance systems. Those reports, uh, I would have to check on the dates of those reports and get back to you for the record for those accident investigations. Thank you very much. I yield back. The gentlelady kneels back. Uh, Mr. Lowenthal, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you. And thank you, Chair uh, Herman Omendi, uh, for being with us today. I'm going to return uh, to a theme that we've heard frequently uh, during this hearing and this reauthorization. And that's the, uh, uh, the theme of why do investigations and data collection takes uh, reporting takes so long? You know, you mentioned in your opening testimony your agency's ongoing investigation uh, into the ship striking a pipeline off the coast of uh, between Huntington Beach and Long Beach, uh, California. Uh, this incident substantially impacted communities and ecosystems throughout Southern California, including uh, residents of my district. And while I understand that many agencies and many people are investigating this incident, uh, and you cannot comment on the specifics of this ongoing matter, I would like to emphasize how important a quick resolution of this process and a timely report will be to my constituents. Um, as you're aware, a pipeline, a pipeline investigations take an average of 21.8 months. Um, oh, and, and that's the average over the last five years. Uh, can you elaborate on what Congress can do and what your agency can do to reduce this time lag and produce timely and actionable data more quickly. Thank you for the question. And for that specific pipeline uh, accident, we will have our own report, but I believe the Coast Guard is the lead in that investigation. Uh, with respect to our investigative process, uh, we are looking at efficiencies. Right now, we've looked at the data. We've identified areas where we believe has held up the investigations. It's actually not in the investigative process many times, uh, but is in the uh, report writing and editing process. And um, uh, uh, there are efficiencies taking place on, on uh, that one. Uh, on, I'm sorry, in that area. And we are also dedicating additional resources we, where we can, filling uh, uh, gaps in vacancies, making sure they have adequate resources. I will tell you that for our pipeline personnel, we have six uh, pipeline investigators. This one in particular that you mentioned regarding the LE platform, uh, is being led by our marine safety team, and they have 11 investigators. So while we put forward process improvements in terms of scaling investigations and making sure we have adequate processes in place to move forward on investigations, we also need to match that with additional resources. And certainly in marine safety, our um, Accidents uh, profile has increased eightfold over the last decade, but our investigation staff has not. So you're saying that with the numbers of people that you have doing the investigation, that the that the the slowdown in actual reporting is really due to uh, with the report writing. We did collect data and report writing does to ha and review has taken most of the time. We, we didn't have, but you know, before I was chair, we didn't have information on where the holdup was. Our team behind me 
really took leadership and identified where the areas were that we could improve, including uh, the review. Our investigation will get done, but then the review process takes longer than it should, and we need to get those through. In addition, there is one more area that I do want to mention that can hold up our investigations, and that has been uh, when uh, the Coast Guard and others have pursued criminal matters. It can close off our investigation very quickly because witnesses tend to not want to discuss things with us. So that can be an increased complexity in our investigations and has been having, happening more and more. And it's something that, that we're, we're looking to address and trying to address with our partners in safety. And just before I yield back, I realize that you can't comment specifically on this case, but that last comment that you made about people being reluctant to uh, testify uh, because of potential criminal matters may be applicable to this to this pipeline. So I uh, the, the rupture of this pipeline. So with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Cedars, Mr. Lich, and Mr. Archinclos. Are they available? Well, with that, that concludes our hearing. Uh, I want to say to Ms. Car Madam Hammondy that uh, you're doing a lot with little. And the question for Mr. Jimenez is Ray, yeah, sub sub substantiating the reason for request to increase in budget. Be sure that we get that so the committee, subcommittee can review. And congratulations to you and your staff for preeminent investigative body that you have. This concludes our hearing, as I said. I would like to thank her for Thank you for your testimony. It's been very helpful and uh, informative. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such a time as our witness has provided answers to any questions that may have been submitted to her for writing. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments uh, that uh, and information submitted by members uh, or the witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. And without objection, it's so ordered. The committee stands adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.